I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, this is part two. Part two of our series covering the Every entire decade. 20th century. Just this, we should we, we should probably start really humming Ride of the Valkyries. Mm-hmm. Dun, da, 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 da. Thus proving that neither of us can carry a tune. But that's, <laughs> that's absolutely right. Yeah. Although only one of us has been in a band. Rob. That's true. Although I wasn't trying very hard. I could blow your I could really knock your socks off if I was if I was trying hard. But Please. uh Please do. Please next don't. Time. Let's yeah. Let's not do that. <laughs> I should bring a guitar in here, and we'll just we'll rock it next time. You should you should write the song for the, the theme podcast. song, the podcast theme song. I haven't gotten around to that. I don't know why. I do. <laughs> I, guess I, you I can't. think it probably has to do with two sons. Yeah, that too. But there's also the the uh, I don't know if you've seen Wag the Dog, but that line where Willie Nelson is trying to write a song about the 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 quote unquote war, and he's like, it's kind of hard to find things that rhyme with Albania. Right, so rhyming things with podcast, uh, it's tricky, right? Mast, mast, do half a mast, song. half mast, full mast. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, so part two. This is nineteen ten to nineteen oh nine. So no, 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 sorry, nineteen nineteen. No, sorry, nineteen. We're go- <laughs> it's one year, and we're going in reverse. We're just gonna mess with you. Nineteen ten to nineteen nineteen. Although you have to admit. If we did this going in reverse, that would be really interesting, wouldn't it? It'd be something that Wu Jianren would do. That would be. No, if Wu Jianren were doing it, we would just like do two years here, four years there, <laughs> the year 200 AD here. So Rom, 1910 to 1919. So let's let's just we didn't do this last time, but let's just let's just set the stage a little bit here. The the Qing Dynasty falls in 1911. 1912, depending 19, on how you classify. 11 or 12. Yeah. The, the, we should we should say that October. 10th mm. is when the rebellion against the Qing breaks out in a, a city that maybe a year ago or a year or two ago you might not have heard about, but it's in central China. It's called Wuhan. Mm. Um, so it, it was known for something besides the virus. That's true. And is. If you're in China, it's known for spicy food, but that's sort of true. Sort of true. Um, so so the, the rebellion breaks out in October 10th. Uh, 1911, and eventually the Qing Empire wraps up uh, in late winter. I'd say sometime in February in 1912, yep. depending on how you how you count the fall of the Qing. Right. Um, so China's final empire is done, supposedly. Now, although we don't right. know if Xi Jinping is going to become right. declare true. himself emperor. Very right true. Now. Very true. But for all intents and purposes, until it becomes formalized. That's the last emperor, the last empire. And now we have who knows what. Like it, it, this is typically Blank the Republican space. period, but really the people that run the country for the next what, 30 something years are warlords. So you can think of the period from 1912 to 1925, 1926 as this kind of question mark. Right. The warlords do continue on to exert influence after 1925, 1926, but increasingly there is a national government in the form of the Republic of China uh, led by the Kuomintang Party. Mm. That's oftentimes spelled the KMT or the GMD uh, for for a variety of reasons. Um, But this period from 1910 to 1919 is a really turbulent yes, period. Very it's much so. You can you can kind of think of it as I mean, when you go into historiography of the People's Republic of China, this period is is kind of the the sort of one of the beginnings of yeah. modernity of yeah. modern China. Most modern literature anthologies start. Probably 1918, 1919. There's, like I said before in the last podcast, there's very few things before, like 1900 to 1918 or so, there's very few things ever included in the anthology. Yeah. Uh, partially because everyone is just putting their toes in the water going, huh, what is this stuff that we're reading that's new and we haven't read before? And, and it's kind of trying to... to, to mm. um, so to... to Feel the stones to cross, well, cross yeah. the river by feeling the stones. Cross the river by which was also Deng Xiaoping's thing it's about, Deng Xiaoping, yeah, yeah, thank you about the market um, economy. But because China is trying to figure out, like Chinese writers are trying to figure out what the heck is going on, it's 
it's it, it's not really that good. So Wu Jinrim, we talked about last podcast. I said he was the best that the first decade of the 20th century had to offer, but I think we both agree he's not very good. No. But this decade is when things kind of start to, like you could make the argument that some of the stuff is really good. And even today, the most famous writer for this period who I have chosen as my representative of this decade, that is Lu Xun, is he is still the most important writer in the PRC. Right, and, and you know, I'm going to put in Lu Xun in my list, but not here, okay. for the very simple reason that uh, Lu Xun, like a whole lot of other people in this period, find themselves kind of adrift. Uh, like a lot of students, a lot of scholars, he went to Japan, so did Wang Guowei, so did Hu Shi, so did a lot of people. Actually, Hu Shi went to the U.S. Anyway, and the U.K. Um, anyway, he studied abroad, and there was a sense in the late Qing, and I've heard a professor, one of my favorite professors at Nankai lectured intensively on this, that there was this intellectual ferment in the late Qing with people going, wow, this is all new, let's see where it goes, you know? Then there's a period right towards the end of the empire when everybody goes, maybe it's going nowhere. And Lu Xun spends most of this decade adrift. He teaches. He doesn't really like teaching, but he teaches. Um, he does translation work. He does translation work. He, In fact, one of the most seminal works of early Chinese translation is it really, I think only like 50 people ever read it at the time. Self-published journal he and his brother Zhou Zoran did in 1910. Um, and it's it's notable because it's one of the first times that someone tried to translate more or less directly from one foreign language to Chinese. Like, not switching things around and dicing them up, just like almost word for word. Very, very different, very peculiar. Anyway, he writes next to nothing until about 1918. He has to sort of be coaxed out of semi-retirement by a friend, and that friend gets him to write what is one of the most famous stories in the history of Chinese literature. It is probably the most famous story, Modern story. Mm -hmm. in in the PRC that right. is in China. Mm. And it's a madman's diary. diary mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Rom, you're saving Lucian for the next decade. I'm saving and I'll explain why when we get to that decade for a lot of reasons. Partly though it's because like I just said, he writes almost nothing. And of course what he does write is, is only is world one of the shaking. most important works in Chinese right. literature. But I'm going to pick one of the people he is contemporaneous with and actually very good friends with, Li Da Zhao. Uh, I'm sorry, Li Da Zhao, who is China's first Marxist, or at least first notable Marxist, by which I mean he's one of the first that actually starts writing about it, commenting on it. He writes some of the earliest works on Bolshevism in Russia. Um, he is also one of the driving forces behind what is arguably the most important publication full stop until about 1920 or so, which is New new Youth, New Spring, Xin Qing Nian. Um, and it's important partly because it's what publishes Lu Xun's work uh, in 1918, but it's also Li Da Zhao's early work is important because he's one of the first to start actually trying to put into words, what is this zeitgeist? Like what is happening here? And Li Da Zhao, just for those of y'all who don't know, he not only helps push the publication of this publication, but he also uh, founds, he, he, he can claim to be the founder of the Chinese Communist Party, along with Chen Dushou, uh, who is uh, also an incredibly influential writer during this period and is, is tied up with Lu Xun, Hu Shi, another, another writer. Um, Li Da Zhao is incredibly important. I would say, though, the most important thing Li Da Zhao did was not something he wrote, but it's a guy who he hired who was almost a footnote in history. Right. Of course, Li Da Zhao was the librarian at the, the Peking University, Peking University, Beijing Da Shui. Um, and he hired an assistant, a little known. Uh, guy from Hunan. What was his name again? Uh, Mao, I believe. Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong, yeah. right. Um, so Li Da Zhao can be credited with bringing Mao into dialogue with a lot of Marxist ideas. Yes. 
And I think that's probably his most... Uh, it's his most important, important contribution, contribution, I think, to Chinese history, Chinese... like you know. And you could even argue ch- to Chinese literature, because after 19, True. N- the 1930s, 1940s, that the sort of Mao's influence on literature is, right. is phenomenal. The important. reason, though, that I pick him for this decade is because... There, he, he publishes in a few installments a a fascinating piece called Qingchun, which you can kind of translate as, as spring or new spring. It is a bizarre piece of writing, and I'm always drawn to things that are transitional, right? So Wang Guowei's piece was transitional. It's the last gasp of a certain kind of scholarship as it moves into a sort of a modern, not just scholarship, modern form of writing, right? Does uh, I didn't even mention last time, but Wang Guowei's uh, poetry notes from the human world is written in a kind of classical genre. Of, kind of, it's, it kind of reads like a blog, right? Just here's a series of things I thought about, right? Mm-hmm. You don't see that very much until you get maybe to the 30s and 40s when you get something called Zawen, which is kind of like that. Here are just some musings. Li Dajiao writes this long piece that's kind of a combination of an essay and a prose poem. As in there's sections where you're reading and you go, yeah, that's definitely poetry. Like the the very regular three or four character phrase repeated here. Some of the some of the idioms and things are right out of classical poetry. And then he'll do something totally different. Ranges all over the map. And it's important because it is an attempt to say, okay, what is it exactly that we're trying to do? What is it we're looking for? What are we seeing around us? Um, and one of his answers is not just things are new in the sense that uh, the Qing dynasty was new for the Ming or something like that. This is something that's never been seen before or happened before. And he's, he's trying to say that this new thing that we're doing, this new nation or whatever it is, is new in the sense that it will be replaced later. We're not establishing some millennial kingdom or anything like that. We're establishing a new way of looking at the world where everything you're seeing now will be replaced later, right? It all has to be regenerative, spring, you know? Um, this also helps kind of codify or put into words what Lu Xun, Zhou Zoran, other people are going to be doing later. So Li Da Zhao's work is some of the earliest to say, this is it, man. This this is what we're doing. I should mention uh, it, it's important to to talk about Lu Xun as well and how he he follows kind of Li Da Zhao's thinking. It almost seems like Li Da Zhao and Lu Xun are both uh, anticipating or or something like that. Uh, Ezra Pound's mm. notion make it new. Yeah. Of course, Li Da Zhao and Lu Xun are writing several years before Ezra Pound. It becomes big, and if anything, Ezra Pound is drawing off of them. But there is this sense that both of them are trying to make Chinese culture into something that is modern. Right. They're trying to make it new. Right. And uh, so with Lu Xun, we've done a podcast on Lu Xun's uh, uh, Diary of a Madman, Kuang Ren Ruoji. And we, the, I, I think it bears repeating the sort of plot of that piece. It's essentially premised on the idea that Confucianism is uh, not uh, a sort of the save- salvation of China, but it's actually consuming Chinese bodies. And he, he at, at a certain point, a man writing this piece a diary a diary comes to the realization that confucianism is all about eating other people and he's concerned that he keeps seeing this phrase in the classics eat people eat people eat people that's what he's seeing anyway. and then he sees all around him he thinks he suspects his brother is trying to eat him he suspects his brother is trying to fatten him up so he can eat him he suspects that neighbor's dog is going to eat him all of these kinds of things uh, and it's never really clear what exactly the short story that is the diary along with the mm. uh, prologue at the beginning is saying. Now, right. if you read this in a 
contemporary Chinese classroom. If you went to Beida or if you went to Nanda or mm. somewhere like that, you would get this very clear interpretation. Here, the, he was critiquing the classics. This is what he was doing, or classical he was, culture. He was critiquing Confucianism, right? right. Um, but Lu Xun's always more complicated than that. He's he's so complicated. This is why he's definitely on my list. I mean, there's no way you can compile any kind of list of anything in the 20th century in China without Lu Xun. Um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that, but well, okay, that's fine. fine. If you were going to do like a list of best dancers, he might not be on there. Although I don't know, I've never seen him dance. Maybe, maybe he doesn't. He does definitely have the best mustache that's of Chinese very literature true. in the 20th 100%. century. He's like that Tom Selleck mustache. He's the Tom Selleck <laughs> of Chinese literature. There we go. That's, that's <laughs> the Magnum PI of Chinese literature. While we're really dating ourselves, I bet some of the, actually some of our <laughs> listeners will probably know. None of them are probably. Teenagers. I doubt any teenagers are listening to us. If you are a teenager, please let please, us know. Please don't please, watch Magnum PI. Please, please TikTok us. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're <laughs> well, you still can. <laughs> we're definitely TikTok fodder. Uh, no, I mean, the, the, the Diary of a Madman is, is a descendably complex story. If you read it apart from the commentary, you'll find yourself going, wait a minute, though. What, what about this? Right? Well, how does this square with that critique, right? Particularly the, the prologue that I mentioned. So Lu Xun is writing the story. He's pretty much the first author in Chinese to write something in... Uh, like a diary. No, no, well, I mean, in vernacular, too. There were other writers who were writing in vernacular in the Ming and Qing, but this is how at least Lu Xun is represented in contemporary Chinese literature. Oh, I see. Gotcha. He, you know, like if you were to go to Nankai... They would say, you know, Lu Xun is the first author to write something in vernacular Chinese. Now that's not true. Actually, to be fair, a lot of them probably would not say that. But that's that's but the that's the official line. That's the official line, right? Um, and it's not true. It's completely right. not true. Uh, there are people writing in vernacular for five, six, seven hundred years before. But it's a very different vernacular. It's a very different vernacular. But Lu Xun, even Lu Xun's vernacular is. Not not no. vernacular, and just just in case we've got someone coming in from Fox News who doesn't know what vernacular <laughs> means, um, vernacular is is spoken language, or it's it's you know written language. What we're that's what we're reflect, using right now is vernacular that reflects spoken language. So as opposed to classical language, so Literary we don't really have language. a classical language tradition in English, but Latin would be the the, the equivalent. equivalent. Yeah. yeah. So in you know until. 16, 1700, I mean, Petrarch wrote some of his poetry in Latin, some of it in, in vernacular Italian. Today, he's recognized as kind of one of the fathers of vernacular Italian literature. But back in the day when he was writing, all of, the, all of his bros were like, why are you writing in vernacular? No one reads that. It sounds um, stupid. It's like, it's like writing something important and putting it into a meme or something. Yeah. He's the early memes. Exactly. Um, so Lu Xun actually writes this first story, Kuang Ren Ji, Diary of a Madman, as mostly in vernacular. Right. But the very beginning is in classical. And we talked about this, I think, in the episode podcast, that we yeah. did mm -hmm. on this. But the, the, verna or the vernacular is the story of the madman. And the, the classical section is the story of this guy who runs into his friend whose brother has produced this diary. Right. And essentially the classical section says, he's all better. He's fine. Don't worry about it. There's no problem. But and, this is what he wrote. And But this is what he wrote. And there's this epistemological question that makes it so interesting. When I teach this story to Chinese students, they always go, but look, the first part is it says – you know, this is, he's totally fine, so we don't even have to worry about him. Um, and that's who they initially trust. But then when they give the classical Kami interpretation, they always say, actually, you have to trust this guy. So there is this kind of interesting conflict going on between these two parts of the narrative written by two, in two totally separate voices. And you know, it's interesting because I'm always, I'm always uh, interested in this when we're doing this series in how these writers reflect like if you're gonna if you're gonna study writers to understand a certain period why you would go with them and i feel like there's an intersection with both of 
these people, Li Dajiao and Lu Xun, partly in the sense that their popular reception is always less interesting than what they actually wrote. So Li Dajiao is the Chinese Marxist. He's the dude that kicks it off. Now, if you hear that, you're likely to roll your eyes and go, oh, great, just what we need, like the guy, the, the father of the propaganda posters we see in the subways and things like that. Um, read Qing Chun, read Spring or New Youth, however you want to translate that, and then tell me what you think. Because even if you don't like it, it's utterly bizarre. It's, it's, it's unlike anything you've ever read before. And at the same period, he is writing a, what is Bolshevism? How are we to understand what's coming out of the Soviet Union? Which is a far more comprehensive study than you would think. Uh, this isn't a hooray for Bolshevism, let's go out and overthrow the government. It's a consideration. What is this thing? What are we to do with this thing exactly? And this is also what Lu Xun is doing. He, he's, he's channeling a lot of these struggles, but it's not easy. Like, reading, if you read Diary of a Madman, The True Story of Akiu, which comes a little later, they're way more complex than they're popularly presented. And in fact, Lu Xun as a person is way more complex than he is presented. I mean, it's important to remember, by 1918, he's already been publishing for almost 20 years, right? He starts publishing in 1901, right? That's a long time. So for, for most people, 17 years is already a literary career. So before he even kicks it off, he's already had to struggle with all of this stuff, cast it over the side of the boat, and then kind of try to start all over again. Um, Li Dajiao doesn't throw it over the side of the boat, uh, but you're coming out of the fall of China's last empire. You're looking around for options. Um and in fact, I, I've heard it. You know who Maurice Meisner is, right? The historian? Okay. Thanks. Maurice Meisner is one of my favorite uh, historians about China. And he, he wrote one of the early, if I, maybe the only really monograph on Li Dajiao, just called Li Dajiao and the Origins of Chinese Marxism. But in that one, though, he's asking the question, why, why Marxism? Why not democracy? Why not something else? Why did, some, why did China eventually go the Marxist route? And one of his thoughts is because... You, you basically had two options if you wanted to, to make something happen, right? You went the, the European-American route, democracy, republic, whatever. Or you went the Russian route, which was, which was Bolshevism, Leninism, whatever, right? Both did stuff. Both made things happen. Now World War I happens. The Versailles Peace Treaty comes around. And the Europeans in particular go, well, Europeans and Americans go, you know what, I think we're going to go ahead and, and give Qingdao to the Japanese after all. And the Chinese look around and are like, what the... Uh, I see. So this is democracy. I get it. Maybe we'll look somewhere else. And the the Chinese had actually entered the war on the Allied side right. as a way to win back. To get exactly that, right. To win back Qingdao for themselves. And we should point out that uh, according to John, Pom John Pomfrey, the author of The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, this is when that little-known assistant librarian that wow. we were talking about before, Mao Zedong, he previously, before this, was very pro-American. And after, after the 1919 uh, problem, he became quite anti-American. Hmm. And uh, throughout his, the rest of his career, he caused quite a few problems for America. Yes, he did. Um, so... So just know if you're if you're working as a diplomat now, the decisions you make might not uh, have the aftershocks happen for another be three careful. Or four decades. Be careful. So my 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 parting thought here would be, um, the first two periods we're looking at here have essentially, for me at least, transitional works, uh, works that are experimental. Uh, they, they bring in some European influences, some uh, classical Chinese influences. Um, they're very unique. But after this period, arguably, this is, this is what I believe anyway, you don't really get any attempt at combination anymore. Uh, whatever else Diary of a Madman might be, you can't really compare it to anything else before it in the Chinese tradition. You can compare it to the work that he was imitating that is Nikolai Gogol's right but I'm saying in the Chinese yeah but the yeah. Chinese tradition 
you don't really, there's nothing else like this, right? And in fact, there's nothing like the true story of Aku. There's nothing like the poetry sure. of Wendy Duel. From here on out, there's a self-conscious attempt not to be what happened before. Again, we go back to Ezra Pound. Right. He, this is make it new. Make it new. Lu Xun was saying, make it new. Ku Shi, Li Da Zhao, make it Chen new. Mm -hmm. We're all crying out. Make it new. Make yeah. Chinese literature new. New make again. <laughs> Not new again. <laughs> right, babe? Yeah. Make it new. They didn't have red hats. They didn't. And they didn't have, and they probably, if they did, they would have fitted better than the red hats that they have now. Um, <laughs> eventually, Li Da Zhao and and Lu Xun do, do have red uh, do, hats. Do have of red a hats. <laughs> if, it depends on how you define red, red hats. Red hats, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, my final thought. So we said that Lu Xun had the most important mustache. Oh, of all of by Chinese far. literature in the 20th century. I I would debate that actually. Oh, really? Li Da Zhao. Oh, that's true. Li Da Zhao had the handle like the full. Ay, wow. You he could have, have been a, a sheriff in Kansas. Look at that. He's got waxed tips in the whole thing. Oh, man. That's him. Wow. I wish I could grow now a mustache. Now, like if we him. were to just debate mustaches, who would win that one? Yeah, I think Li Da Zhao. I think Li Da Zhao wins. I, I would, coming into this, I would have said Lu Xun definitely, but Li Da Zhao. Mm. He takes the cake. Lucian looks cooler with his. Li Da Zhao no. looks like, no, a, don't like, even a, start. like a doctor don't even in an old start. Western movie or something. I know. He looks cooler. All right. Fair enough. Rob, if we have fans who need more Chinese lit, where do they go to get kind of inundated by our social media fountains? <laughs> Where do they get to ho get? Where, where where can I get hosed down with more Chinese literature? Oh word, there's so many things wrong with everything you <laughs> just said. I won't even count the ways. But <laughs> keep in e mind, I am a Freudian. <laughs> well, I 100 percent believe that from what you just said. Uh, Twitter, Chinlit Pod, Chinese Literature Podcast, abbreviation Chinlit Pod. Instagram at Chinese Lit Pod. Uh, you can also go over to Patreon, Chinese Literature Podcast, to buy us that private island we've been dreaming of mm -hmm. um not just the two of us you know us and many people that sounds wrong if we say it that way uh the website so wrong it is it's, so wrong it's, it's so wrong that it's right in a way uh the website chinese literature podcast.com and chinese literature podcast at gmail.com if we, you want to send us an email we love getting fan mail from absolutely. folks we also really love hearing what we can do to improve and we love featuring people on the podcast a lot of yeah. the interviews you've heard are people who've emailed us just simply asking to be on the podcast and talk and we do that yeah. quite a bit if you have any kind of expertise in chinese literature if you're a phd student doing research uh if you have a podcast on chinese literature we'd love to hear from absolutely you. so check us out twitter instagram patreon and of course gmail um anyways I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.